thank Joan for inviting me and to give me the chance to participate in this uh, wonderful seminar series. So today I want to talk about language shift and I will illustrate this process of shift on the example of the decline of the Scottish Gaelic, uh, of the, of Scottish Gaelic in Scotland. So first of all, language shift is a process whereby a speech community shifts from speaking one language towards speaking another language. While language shift has been, or the process of language shift is as old as languages itself, it has been around all through history, What's exceptional about <clears throat> this phenomenon is today's incredible high rate of language shift, today's high rate of extinctions caused, uh, caused by language shift. So it is estimated Please. that perhaps... Can have the microphone volume turned up? Sure. Okay, I, I try to speak a little bit louder. <coughs> <coughs> So it is estimated that perhaps half of the world's six to 7,000 languages will be lost during the next 100 years. And even more extreme estimates are done for, uh, for areas with a very high linguistic diversity, for instance, in Africa, where they say that we lose one language a day. So what's happening? Why do we witness this incredible high rate of language extinctions? Well, first of all, People do not shift languages with no good reason. Most of the time, it can be seen as a survival strategy. So we live in what some researchers call a global village. So a person has a chance to, to almost be connected to any other person on the planet. Though in the course of that, globalization, urbanization, and long distance economic migrations, interactions between groups speaking different languages have increased, and so has a need for a common communication base. So in during that process, some languages, for instance English, have come uh, to fill that role for different reasons and therefore have risen in importance for official and non-official matters. But at that point, I want to make it clear that those languages rise or rise in importance not to, due to any intrinsic properties of the languages. It is more or less a property of or let's say the power or the attributes of, spe of people speaking those languages that make them rise in importance. So what we see are, is that minority languages are particularly subject to pressure and at risk of extinction, mainly because speakers perceive an economic gain from shifting. So in most cases, the majority language is the language of higher education, is the language of business. So in order for individuals to take part in those domains, they need to learn the majority language. And that naturally, of course, threatens the transmission of this minority language to the next generations. So what I'm interested in is understanding the temporal and spatial pattern, the temporal and spatial dynamic of this uh, language shift process. So I, I want to ask, are they underlying demographic and, and linguistic principles that drive language shift. And also, in the light of um, recent uh, revitalization programs, which, has been set up, which have been set up by many uh, governments to, um, to rescue a minority language, I want to ask how successful can those programs be? Or in other words, how strong do those interve interventions need to be in order to actually do something to reverse or to even or to alter or to even reverse language shift. So, and I want to do that, or I want to tackle this question. Um, oops, I'm sorry. By using a mathematical model, hopefully we will develop one of this kind. So, if we use mathematical models to describe the linguist system, it should be seen as an effort to abstract driving principles that those principles may be used to analyze and predict the behavior of the system. Importantly, those models are simplified abstract view of a complex reality. We won't capture the whole beauty. We won't capture all the details, but also that's nothing we are after. We ask, are, they, are there underlying principles which actually drive, uh, which drive language shift? 
and can those principles be can, uh, principles captured in a mathematical in a mathematical way and then used to uh, for analysis of further predictions. Okay, I have uh, divided my talk in roughly three parts. First of all, I give you a very, very brief history about modeling uh, language shift. And in the second and third part of my talk, I will um, introduce you to two different modeling approaches. And I will uh, apply these, uh, these approaches to the Gaelic, uh, Gaelic and English competition in Western Scotland. But let's start with <coughs> Or how did it go all? How did it all start? Well, it actually pretty much started in 2003 with a Nature paper by Abrams and Strogatz. Uh, Abrams and Strogatz developed a very simple two-population competition model to explain historical data on the decline of endangered languages. And their idea was that the attractiveness of a language <coughs> increases by two things: by the number of speakers and by the perceived status of the language. This notion of the social status of a language will um, come up a couple of times through this talk. And status, the social status variable men, me, is meant to represent the, the benefits a language conveys to a speaker. So it actually collapses a lot of things in a single variable. It collapses a kind of cultural, um, economic, social, even political um, <clears throat> benefits into a single variable. That is important to note. So the Abrams and Sorgans model, unfortunately for any, for any linguistic diversity, um, showed that any context situations will end up, well, with just one surviving language. Okay, just a tiny little bit more detail. The basic idea of Abrams and Strogatz was to assume that the temporal change of the usage of a language is defined by the difference of the number of speakers acquiring a language and the number of speakers giving up the language. And they assumed that this decision of either acquiring or giving up a language is determined A, by the number of present speakers of the other language and by the status of the other language around. So the idea is, if I'm surrounded by speakers of another language, of course I have a high motivation to learn the other, <coughs> sorry, to learn the other language just to be able to communicate. And the same applies to social status. If there is another language which uh, gives me a higher status or which, which conveys higher benefit to me, I I'm I'm have more motivation to learn this language. Okay, and then they applied their model to a couple of <coughs> um, kind of historical case studies where we see a clear decline um, of what's now an endangered language. And as we will come back to the, to the situation of Scottish Gaelic, here's the example they found. So what you see are those squares represent empirical data. And these are actually um, kind of combined data on monolingual Gaelic speakers and bilingual speakers. So what you see here, so the square, are actual data on those two language groups. So and the solid line is the fit of their model. So what you see is a beautiful fit, and probably because of this beautiful fit, um, that was quite an influential paper. Um, however, the model subsequently was subsequently subsequently, sorry, uh, was criticized highly, especially by, by, uh, by linguists, because it assumed a couple of very unrealistic, um, unrealistic things. First of all, languages are assumed to be fixed, they don't evolve. Second, populations are highly connected with no spatial or social structure. All speakers are monolingual, though there is no notion of a bilingualism in the <coughs> model. And the population size is assumed to be constant, so we have no population growth or we have no effects of uh, population decline. So, and starting from that <coughs> first paper, there's quite a number of subsequent modeling approaches who try to, to generalize uh, the Abrams and Strogan's model by addressing one or more of these shortcomings. And just to give you an idea what people do, <coughs> those models uh, fall broadly in these two categories. So we have continuous models and we have discrete agent-based simulations. I don't want to go in any, uh, any details of those, just, just to give you a sense of um, what those um, models stands for, uh, stand for. 
So continuous models, they act on the population level. So continuous models <coughs> describe the average behavior at the population level. So, so they, they don't deal with any individual behavior. They also cannot include any heter heterogeneity at the individual level. However, what they are very good at is describing kind of what's going on on average in the population. And also we can very easily <coughs> include uh, a more realistic modeling of demography, but also of the language shift process. So contrary to these kind of macro level models, there's a different category called, well, discrete or agent-based simulations. And here the focus is completely different. Here we focus on agents, on the behavior of different agents. So agent-based simulations act on the individual level and model actions on interactions of agents with themselves and with the environment with a view of assessing the effects on the whole system. So what we have are individuals which interact with each other and then we see emergent some population level, uh, some population level pattern. So that is the two categories <coughs> which have been used to tackle the problem of language shift. And I just want to um, argue for one thing and that, that those models should not be seen as competing. Sometimes in the literature it's asked, well, what's the right model? What, how should we do that? And I think it's, a, it's, it's not a very fruitful discussion because both models or mo classes of, of models look at the same problem from complete different angles and they give us insight on a different level. Here we understand what the population is doing on average. Here we understand which individual level behavior gives rise to what population level uh, uh, pattern. So we will gain insights and I hope I can demonstrate that during the talk that actually setting up two models for the, se for the same problem gives us more insights than just a kind of dealing with one uh, inverted commas right model. Okay, let's get started. Let's get started with the first with the continuous modeling approach. I promise that's the only uh, kind of equation I will ever show in this talk. <coughs> so um, we, will study, um, we will study language shift in the following framework. We have two population groups in the same domain which speak two mutually, mutually unintelligible languages. So due to this context situation and the desire of individuals to communicate, we need a common communication base. And that causes kind of a competition between the languages. Those com these, these languages compete with each other for speakers. And of course, this competition is captured by the decision of individuals of which language to learn, but also which language to transmit to the next generation. So in our model, we implicitly assume that language shift needs to go through a transitional bilingual state. Okay, uh, the idea is again that the temporal change of the usage of a language within a certain region, uh, region is determined by two demographic components and a linguistic component. component. So we include spatial dispersal, intrin intrinsic population growth, meaning birth death processes, and the interactions between those two languages in our model. So in this dynamic can be very comfortably um, translated uh, into a, such a what's called a reaction diffusion competition model. Uh, just to give you a tiny, uh, a slight idea of how that works. <coughs> those, um, those parameters, or those variables, U1 and U3, describe the frequency of our monolingual group. So those guys speak language one, those guys speak language two. Whereas variable U2 describes the frequency of our bilingual group. So. This term on the left side gives us the temporal change in those frequency, and this temporal change is determined by spatial dispersal, captured by a very simple diffusion process, intrinsic growth, captured by a bounded logistic growth process with a little caveat of a common carrying capacity, and by those shift terms, which quantify the interaction the interchange between, uh, between these three population groups. So just to make it a little bit more clear, the scheme um, kind of represents the, the flow between these three population groups. And just to reiterate again, we assume that the presence of speakers of different languages in the same domain 
causes a need for a common communication base. It causes a need for monolingual individuals to become bilingual. And similar to the Abrams and Storgatz model, we assume that kind of the outflux from the monolingual group to the bilingual group is frequency dependent and it's status dependent. So the more speakers of the other language are around, the stronger is this outflux, the stronger is the motivation to learn the other language and therefore to become bilingual. And the same is true for social status. The more benefit the other language conveys, the stronger is this outflux, the stronger uh, uh, is the motivation to become bilingual. But of course, there's also a flow backwards from bilingual to, uh, to our monolingual groups. And in reality, uh, that is <coughs> due to bilingual parents which decide to teach only one language to their children. And again, the decision to which language to teach is frequency dependent and status dependent. Okay, so that's our basic model. Please allow me like five minutes for a little bit of a mathematical analysis just to give you an idea of what kind of results we actually can get out uh, from, from, from just analyzing such a mathematical model. So let us consider the situation where language one is higher status. So language one is a preferred target of switching. So the first question we should ask is, what are the stable equilibria of our system? So where will our system end up? And unfortunately, again, we have no good use in terms of linguistic diversity. Only extinction states are stable. But the interesting thing is, we have assumed that language one is a high status language. But also, the extinction state of language one is actually a stable state. And that, of course, poses a question, when can that happen? What are the other factors other than status which kind of contribute to language shift? Can demography influence language shift? I mean, the answer here is, of course, yes, it can big time. So the lesson to be learned from that is, in order to model language shift, we have to get demography right. And I want to illustrate that to you on a little example. Oops, I apologize. My Mac just broke, or my, my PC just broke, and they gave me a Mac, and I still cannot use it properly. So what we see here <coughs> is just a little simulation. We have a complete arbitrary two-dimensional domain. This two-dimensional domain is occupied by speakers of a low status language, and we introduce speakers of a higher status language in a certain area. So now we ask, given the status and given some demographic properties, is the high or is the high status language able kind of to overtake? Does language shift happen in, uh, from the direction from the low status language to the high status language? So, and everybody, sorry, as I said. <laughs> for the end of the movie, we just need to go back. <laughs> You see the best things before. <laughs> so, so here we go. <clears throat> That's the area where we introduce our, our speakers of our high status language, and that is just a cut through the, uh, through the domain exactly here, just to give you a little bit more detail of what's going on. So, so time goes on. And first of all, what we see is here, we see the emergence of a bilingual subpopulation. <clears throat> so we had our monolinguals uh, low status, monolinguals high status. They come in contact. And due to this contact situation, we have immediately bilingual uh, individuals emerge. So and now we have to look what our, what our speakers of the high status language do. And here we assume that they are actually very curious that they have a very high rate of dispersal. So they don't like to stick together. They like to explore. They like to venture out. So and what's happening here is that due to this migration or due to this, this high frequent dispersal, the competitive advantage they had is actually diluted. So we now come to situations where <clears throat> even so, that's a high status language. 
a lot of a few peop uh, speakers of this high status language are surrounded by a lot of speakers of the low status language. And even though they have a status advantage, the sheer size effect makes them switch towards the other language. So what we see is that, well, it wasn't that successful, but just simply due to demography. This just spread out far too quickly. And with the vanishing of our monolingual population, of course, the bilingual population vanished too, as there is no reason for them to be, um, to be bilingual anymore uh, because the other language is not, is not around. Good. And now what happens if we change demography? We have exactly the same setup, but now we just assume that they like to stick more together, that they disperse uh, much more slowly. And what we see is that that is the key to successful invasion. So we see pretty much the same. However, if you see now here, they stick much more together. So, and due to the sticking more together, they kind of keep their advantage. They have a higher frequency in the area where they invaded. And with this higher frequency plus the status advantage, <coughs> they are able to basically outcompete, if you want to, want to say so, speakers <coughs> of the uh, low status but still majority language in this initial area. And since they win the competition in this initial area, we see kind of a traveling wave-like behavior where our high status language actually takes over the whole domain. So and that's what you're going to see now. So slowly but surely, we see an increase in the frequency of the high status language. We also see very nicely that our bilingual population is there where there's, there's contact, where, where there's two languages in the same domain. <coughs> so and well now, we already see what's happening. There is no hope now for our, for our low status language. <coughs> it has, the high status language has won the competition in that area. And now we see this traveling wave-like uh, behavior and our uh, high status language takes over the whole domain. And that is just an example where demography, population expansion have a huge impact on shift dynamics, whether it's language shift or cultural shifts. So in order to do that uh, properly, we have to, uh, in order to model language shift properly, we have to get the demography right first. Okay. Good, but back to the, dim back to the presentation. Okay, I think I said enough about that point. <coughs> and let's come now to uh, the more exciting <coughs> part, actually the case study. So Scottish Gaelic is one of the six um, still living, or at least still recently living, Celtic languages, alongside uh, Irish, Irish Gaelic, uh, Breton, Cornish, Manx, and Welsh. So, and the situation for Gaelic uh, was the following, just historically. Uh, in Scotland, by late medieval times, Gaelic was the main language of the Highlands and Western Islands, with Scots and English prevailing in the Lowlands. That is actually something very important also for later. Scots Gaelic was never spoken in whole Scotland. The core area of the Gaelic language was the Highland. The Lowland spoke something different. They spoke Scots and English. So with Scots, <coughs> it's still a debate whether it's, an in, uh, whether it's an own language or whether it's actually an old English dialect. But we have this division in the country already. So, and then what happened is that political, economic dominance of the English-speaking elite and their interference with Highland political and economic systems, as well as the establishment of English as a language of education and drastic demographic changes were associated with increasing rates of Gaelic to English language shift. So, especially this Highland clearance was, well, unfortunately, a very efficient way of the English elite basically to get rid or trying to get rid of the Celtic culture. So what they actually did was taking people of Celtic descent and actually shipped them over to America. I read a study recently which was saying that actually more people with Celtic ancestors can be found in America than they still uh, can be found uh, in, in, in Scotland. So that's all, uh, well, thanks to this um, very unfortunate Highland clearance. So one of the reasons why we focus on that study was that we have actually very nice data. So the UK census started 
from 1891 on onwards to ask language questions. So we have frequencies of Gallic monolinguals, ga uh, English monolinguals and bilingual speakers uh, from 1891 onwards. And what you see are those pictures here are real data. So and you see the decline of the Gallic monolingual population over time. And it looks like kind of really like a traveling wave-like pattern that the Gallic language is pushed out almost into the ocean and that it's only now present in what's the Western, what, what they are the Western islands. So that's the data we can work with. And we can, I think it clearly illustrates kind of the, the, the trend of what's happening with the Gallic language. <coughs> so our study area is, are of course the highlands. That's the core area of the Gallic language. Just remember that are the lowlands and Gallic was actually never the main language uh, in this area. So we will look at the counties Argyle, Inverness, Rosencromarty, and Sutherland. So there are the results. Um, first of all, those four figures correspond to the four different counties. We have here Argyle, we have here Inverness, Rosencromarty, and here we have Sutherland. So solid lines are the empirical data uh, aggregated for those, uh, for those four uh, counties. We see the red line is the frequency of monolingual English speakers, the blue line are the frequency of monolingual Gaelic speakers, and the green line is the frequency of the bilingual population. So, and what we see is a very clear pattern, even so there are little regional differences, but Gaelic, monolingual Gaelic almost everywhere extinct. English is of course on the rise, and our bi uh, bilingual population of course declines very drastically too. So now, uh, of course, with these data in hand, we can ask, well, how well does our model in estimating or in replicating these past trajectories? And our model is actually these uh, dashed lines. And so we can conclude that our model actually replicates the past trajectories quite well. What is nice, however, it's not too helpful as we know already what, you know, what has been in the past. So what we can now ask is, well, what can the model tell us about the future? And just remember what we said before, the only equilibrium states of our model are the extinction states. Though it predicts a rather dark future of, of the Gaelic language. But, well, I wouldn't want to end the talk on that because what's happening at the moment in Scotland is changing the picture. The government puts a lot of effort and also a lot of money into maintaining Gaelic as a living language. So they establish primary, uh, Gaelic primary uh, school units, uh, Gaelic-speaking preschool uh, playgroups. They uh, founded <coughs> the Gaelic Television Committee, which ensures the incorporation of Gaelic programs in the Scottish TV. So if you watch the BBC News in the evening, you have the BBC News in Gaelic, <coughs> with English subtitles. So. Um, and perhaps most importantly, they passed the Gaelic Language Act in 2005. And this Language Act provides a planning framework for a number of additional uh, shift reversal measures. So it gives little counties <coughs> the opportunity to adopt Gaelic as a primary language. <coughs> so if you do so, if you adopt Gaelic as a primary language, then whole, the whole of the administration is done in Gaelic. So if you work in the town hall, if you work in any position in administration, you have to speak Gaelic, otherwise you cannot work there. And this little uh, county at the Western Islands, which I cannot pronounce, was the first to adopt Gaelic actually as a primary, uh, uh, as a primary uh, language. Now I think four others have followed. So what the Scottish government is doing is actually it's, it's artificial niche construction. It tries to, to create domains where the Gaelic language is still used. It's actually the preferred medium of communication. So there's a need why we need to keep Gaelic in the population. And our model cannot deal with that so far. Because what we looked so far is competition or well, language contact in a single social domain. So we didn't distinguish between different social domains where different languages might be differently uh, uh, 
differently preferred in use. So in order to, to introduce as, uh, sorry, in order to introduce those kind of maintenance interventions, we, ha we need to include those. We need to include different domains where languages are differently preferred. So we, uh, we do that by incorporating the linguistic concept of deglossia into our model. So deglossia is a situation where in a given population, two languages, usually one of high prestige and one of low prestige, are differently preferred in different spatial uh, social domains. So you think of it, let's say, as a work and home environment. At work, you need to speak English or Gaelic, depending on how you see it. And at home, you might revert to something else. So you have two social domains with different, um, with different uh, use of, of the two languages. So we allow now our model, or in our model, we now allow for segregated and complementary social linguistic domains, in each of which one language is preferred as a medium of communication. And in doing so, we implement basically these uh, revitalization strategies into our model. And now we can ask, how strong does this segregation, how strong does those intervention mechanisms need to be in order to change things, in order to at least uh, stabilize our bilingual population at its current level? And, well, the answer we got is we need roughly 860 <coughs> English speakers to become bilingual every year. So in here we're talking about bilingual, not just you know, knowing 10 words and saying, I know how to you know, buy or order in a restaurant. Here we're talking about bilingual in a, in a proper sense, 860 per year. So I find it a, a relatively high um, number that wouldn't make me too optimistic, but let's come, we come to that later. But also what our model told us is, What's important is the intergenerational transmission. If we could increase, let's say, the fraction of parents teaching both, uh, both languages to their kids just by 15%, the number could drop down to roughly 440. So intergenerational transmission is the key thing, and that's something pr very well known from, from, from all the linguistic research. And the model just puts numbers on it. that. What those intervention uh, strategies need to do is target exactly those intergenerational transmission. If it's transmitted, then it has a chance actually to stay a living language. So with these numbers, we were actually um, a little bit nervous when we published it, just because uh, it is actually a highly sensitive and also a highly political issue, especially in Scotland, whether we should put so much money into maintaining the language or we shouldn't, and is it useful or not. Um, but we were surprised. Um, the, the National Gaelic Development Agency, especially the, the, the chair, John Agnes McCain, was actually very pleased with the figures. He said that the report is encouraging as the figure quoted are broadly in line with their own. So actually they expect that their interventions need to be so strong in order to do something, and they are still kind of pretty much optimistic. So uh, he was saying, my initial reaction is that this bears out <coughs> that we are on the right line with the plans approved by the ministers for increasing the number of children in Gaelic medium education, placing more emphasis on parents to use Gaelic in the home, and aiming to increase the number of adult learners. And that was um, kind of published in The Scotsman, which is one of the big uh, kind of Scottish newspapers. So. Quite frankly, I was on one hand very, very pleased because it seemed to be that our model actually captures something real. At the, the numbers we came, came up with didn't seem to be out of outer space. Uh, people thought they are kind of in the right proportion. On the other hand, I was still surprised that, well, there's so much optimism, <laughs> but anyway. Um, so just let me summarize what we have so far. I hope it could convince you that, um, first of all, the proposed modeling framework is able to replicate the past evolutionary trajectories. And then also our model um, kind of gave us some insight into um, what we need to do in order to maintain a language. And those insights we gained from the model actually coincide nicely with <coughs> linguistic theory on how to maintain a language. So first of all, we have seen that establishment or maintenance of segregated social domains where both languages are differently preferred as a medium of communication may lead to stable coexistence 
of languages of different, la uh, of different status. So if you have a minority and a, a majority language, we need to make sure that there's uh, some domain, some social domains where this language is still used, is still the preferred medium of communication. Then, of course, we have seen that intergenerational transmission plays a crucial role. And lastly, coming back to our Gaelic example, uh, we have estimated that we need roughly 860 uh, English speakers to become bilingual, to basically counteract the loss of Gaelic we see, we see um, almost daily now, and loss being, uh, being quantified as bilingual parents not teaching their kids both languages. However, unfortunately, I have to report that the numbers will be quite likely to be higher. And why? Well, that's insights we gained from a different modeling approach. So far, what we have looked at is the average, uh, the average behavior of a population. And we have done it in a framework of differential equations. These differential equations are a very, very powerful tool if we have large population sizes. However, if population size drop, then their predictions might be not that accurate. So in the following, or well, we know that unfortunately endangered languages are usually characterized by low numbers of speakers. And so in the following, we ask, well, do, does the actual number of speakers affect the dynamic of the language shift process? And that's a, <coughs> pardon me. And that's a question we couldn't investigate with um, the, the partial differential equation uh, framework. And that's why we turned to an agent-based um, simulation model. So with this agent-based simulation model, we not only capture the average behavior, but we actually we capture the whole variety of possible shift trajectories. So we give a sense of what is possible and what's not possible. So just quickly, the model set up. Of course, these two models should somehow match. So with our agent-based simulation, we try to mimic the dynamic we had in our continuous model. So we have a dispersal component. Each individual can uh, walk around in space uh, according to certain rules. We have a growth component. An individual can reproduce and it eventually will die. And we have a shift component. So in here, we have a slight difference because just with the focus of individual of individuals now, we can actually make the decision of language shift based on, let's say, experienced usefulness. So we say that the decision of language shift is based on the usefulness of both languages in daily life. And usefulness now is measured as the number of successful and unsuccessful interactions in both languages. So how useful it is for me in daily life to learn or to know English and to learn Gaelic. It's not very useful. Well. I probably won't transmit it uh, any further. OK, so that's the basic setup. Uh, now we run this model, analyzed it, and what we got out of that in 16% of the simulations lead nevertheless to the extinction of the Gaelic language, even with the taken maintenance interventions. So our 860 individuals are likely to be not enough. Already here, in 16% of the cases, Gaelic went extinct nevertheless. And that is just due to random effects. So the smaller the number of, uh, of Gaelic monolinguals and bilinguals, the greater is the influence of just sheer random chance effects on the shift dynamic. And therefore, intervention strategies needs to, or intervention extra have to be much stronger actually to, to ensure a successful, um, let's say, to, to ensure, uh, sorry, uh, ensure a successful intervention. And something, well, that's pretty much clear, a rule of thumb, which w won't help us pretty much in our Gaelic case, but if you want to do interventions, it is as early and as strong as possible. Then they are actually most successful. But I know that's a very broad statement, which um, <coughs> is probably not very helpful. And we have another problem. And the other problem is selective migration. What we witness is kind of captured in this very, very messy plot. So we have here our highlands, the core area of the Gaelic language. Unfortunately, those highlands are economically very weak. So what we see is a migration of inhabitants of the highlands to the lowlands, and there preferably to the big major cities, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen. So what's now happening is that bilingual speakers, they migrate to the lowlands 
They migrate into an area where Gaelic has never been the main language. They migrate into the big cities where they are surrounded by a huge number of English speakers. So it makes the problem even, even worse, kind of to maintain the Gaelic language. And also we run into another problem. Now we have a division of almost 50-50 highlands and lowlands. Whole Scotland doesn't agree on maintaining Gaelic. The lowlands, as I said, uh, they have almost no history in, in Gaelic. And if you speak to parents, they are actually pretty much upset that their children need to learn Gaelic for one year at school. They were saying, why do we need to do that? We have no history. So there is no consensus within the population. And what we see now is that those couple of bilingual speakers migrate into the lowlands where, well, people are not so uh, kind of positive towards, um, towards the Gaelic language. So that poses a, a, a even bigger problem. So we incorporated these uh, a little bit messy looking uh, migration structure. <laughs> By the way, that's just uh, the strength of migration from, from, from certain areas here to Edinburgh, to Glasgow is here, and Aberdeen is here. And you see it's just a very strong shift behavior, or it's just a very strong migratory flux. So we included that as good uh, <clears throat> into our model. And what we found that I mean, not surprisingly, maintenance intervention need to be concentrated on Scottish cities where Gaelic was never the majority. So we cannot just focus on the, the core area. We have to focus on something, on some region where there is no history. And then also, um, well, that's just a, a consequence that the number of English speakers who need to become bilingual every year is likely to be higher. And then also something, what our model showed us, that Maintenance crucially depends on the usage frequency of a language in daily life. It is not enough to teach children Gaelic for like two or three years, whatever, at school, if they are not able to use this language at home or somehow. It doesn't lead to ma or it doesn't lead to, to coexistence. And the model showed that beautifully. If you just have schooling, and if you don't give them the chance to speak it, to interact in that language. It just goes. It just goes. There is no incentive to transmit it, and so it's also nothing, nothing new. Um, linguists know that. However, we can put numbers on it. We can, we can, we can, uh, we can say how strong certain things needs to be. Okay. Let me summarize the second part. <coughs> Demography matters once more. So we have seen before this personal strategy. Uh, is pretty much important. Now we have seen the number of speaker, uh, the number of speakers are important. So if we are already low, uh, it gets harder and harder to maintain the language. But also things like spatial clustering. So if we stick together, if our um, well, if we can form like an enclave of Gaelic speakers, that is probably the best thing. So the best thing would take them all together and put a fence around it, just to to keep them. I was joking. So. These spatial clustering just have a very, very high effect on, uh, on, those, on those shift dynamics. So demography really matters. Interventions need to focus on creating an environment where the endangered language can be used in daily life. So that's, I think, a very important, just schooling or just something, um, just showing BBC News in Gaelic won't bring us very far. And I hope I could convince you that um, we can use actually mathematical modeling as a test environment. So we can, in, with this model, test the success of different intervention strategies and also can ask how strong those need to be in order to see an effect or in order to see a long-term effect. And again, our 860 speakers, again, the estimate is likely too low, but to finish my talk on a brighter note, I read a study which came out last year, which was saying that with all the efforts uh, the Scottish government has undertaken in the last, let's say, 10, 15 years, what has picked up is the interest of young people in Gaelic culture. So there is a big in uh, increase in, let's say, the attendance <coughs> of Highland Games, the, uh, of these Kaylee dancings, even of people who take up bagpipe um, to want to want to learn how to play the bagpipe, or, or or even just wearing traditional Gaelic costumes like the kilt, 
it has increased and as it gets increasing more popular under the young generation. So something has picked up. The young, the young generation is much more interested in, let's say, the Gaelic, the, the cultural heritage. Whether, it will, whether we can see it in the Gaelic language itself, well, hopefully we will find out this year. Because last year, they carried out the last the 2011 census. And again, they asked all those language questions. And hopefully, for all those interventions um, <coughs> which has been done, we should see now already something that has changed. That slowly the, bi the trend of losing bilinguals every year kind of hopefully is altered. And well, we see some success in those intervention strategies. OK, thank you very, very much for your attention. And I also would like to thank uh, my, my collaborators on those projects, uh, James Steele, April McMahon, Peter Austin, Martin, uh, Patrick McConnell, and Michael Dunn, that are mostly archaeologists and linguists, which helped me kind of big time to uh, get into this relatively unfamiliar um, uh, topic, but also to make sure that um, what I'm modeling has actually something to do with um, linguistic reality. Thank you very much. <laughs>